Hey folks, this is Riker with a video on the new preview blog for upcoming Diablo 3 Season 26 Patch 273. After our last couple seasons that have been big ones, I was expecting a quieter season, but once again, we're getting a pretty significant season theme. In this video, we're going to go over this blog, we're going to go over the season theme, we're going to go over the balance changes, we're going to go over the new mechanics being added, and we're going to give some analysis, some thoughts, as well as already I have a suggestion for how to improve one of these ideas even more. And if you want to skip ahead to different sections, you can find links in the description below to the timestamps. Now before we move on, just a quick word from this video's sponsor, Dungeon Fighter Online. The classic 2D beat-em-up action game is celebrating its 7th anniversary with Rebirth of Elven Eel. Every year, DFO has an anniversary celebration that features exclusive new content and events with special rewards. This year introduces the exclusive Elven Eel Town and Area, updated for the celebration. The first anniversary event has a clear daily and weekly missions to restore the sacred tree Vandrasil. The more you restore the tree, the more you are rewarded. Event 2, Elven Tales, has you build up your army, recruit adventurers, and build defense structures to defend Elvenil from monsters. And two more events will also be added later in March. And in addition, until the end of March, you can get exclusive Twitch drop rewards by watching official content creators from the DFO community. DFO is free to play with 14 classes to choose from. I've played it a few times over the years. It's got some really fun beat em up combat. And you can redeem the coupon code Welcome to DFO Gift in game to receive some useful consumables and a funky avatar set. So diving in here, PTR will begin on March 10th. That's Thursday. It's going to last two weeks. So that means we're looking at a potential start date for Season 26 in April. We'll start off with the big thing, the season theme of Season 26, Echoing Nightmare, an optional and rewarding end game challenge where players fight within the memories of Nephilim who fell in a greater rift. Today's Nephilim must stand their ground until they are inevitably overwhelmed with a capital O or defeated. Players must collect a petrified scream from defeated greater rift guardians to gain entry to the echoing nightmare. Transmuting a petrified scream in Kanai's cube summons a portal that players can enter to face the horrors of the Nephilim's past. So, new activity to do. This is something that I've been hoping for for, for a long time as a season theme. Something that gives us something new to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Again, it is optional. It is rewarding. You're going to defeat Greater Rift Guardians. And there's going to be a chance, we don't know what the odds are, that the Greater Rift Guardian drops something called a Petrified Scream. Think of it like a Super Greater Rift key. And with that Petrified Scream, you can enter a Super Greater Rift or an Echoing Nightmare. You do that by taking the Petrified Scream, putting it in Kanai's Cube and transmuting in the same way that you would put in a Bovine Bardiche to open a Cow Level or a Puzzle Ring to open a Portal to the Vault. Now some details, while within an Echoing Nightmare, the difficulty scales as players progress in the encounter. Players can progress faster by defeating monsters quickly. So it sounds like it's just going to keep getting more and more challenging until you eventually die or are overwhelmed. So it only ends in defeat. You're going to get XP, legendary items, blood shards, gems, your standard fare, but also something new. A Whisper of Atonement, which is a legendary gem that can be used only for augmenting ancient legendary items. So, its rank is based on your performance and the Echoing Nightmare. The longer you last, the more you kill, the more you get through that Echoing Nightmare, the higher level the Whisper of Atonement legendary gem. Now, this gem will do nothing else if you put it in any socket. It's just to serve as fodder for augments. In the current season, Season 25, Soul Shards have been very popular and their use as a form of getting quick augments or an alternative method of getting augments has been very popular and players have been desiring to retain some way to do that and this is that implementation. This is another means of which you can get those augments. Dev notes, this is our first seasonal theme that introduces a new activity to the game. In the Echoing Nightmare, players will experience an intense, densely packed, increasingly challenging event that stretches their ability to stay in the fight as long as possible. We found inspiration in Oryx's warning, Many Nephilim have stood where you are now, but few succeeded in overcoming the trials. The Echoing Nightmare explores what happened to those Nephilim who did not succeed. Now, I'm wondering, 
at first when I saw that it's going to be the memories of a Nephilim who fell in a greater rift. Does that mean it's going to be similar to a challenge rift where it's going to be an actual greater rift that someone else did and failed to defeat in the amount of time? Probably not. It feels like given it's something that becomes increasingly and increasingly difficult, it needs to somehow be infinite. Either it's spawning infinite waves of monsters, like the Realm of Trials, if anyone remembers way back in the day. When we had Greater Rifts, in order to open a Greater Rift, you had to go through the Realm of Trials, this little zone where waves of monsters would spawn, and the further you got, the higher the wave, that corresponded to your Greater Rift key. So if you got to wave 50, you can open a Greater Rift 50 for... Just to simplify. So first impression, great addition. We'll come back to revisit this a little bit later, but we'll keep moving on through the changes. Now we're getting Greater Rift updates. Orex Dream. Greater Rifts have a small chance to roll as Orex Dream. These dreamlike rifts have a curated list of maps and monster compositions. These are dream rifts. These are the Greater Rifts that top players dream of because these are the ones that they would want to try to push leaderboards with. We'll get into the whole discussion of fishing in a little bit here. So three maps have been added and two maps have been removed from the Greater Rift pool. They've added Fields of Misery, Desolate Sands, and Briarthorn Cemetery. These are very good maps, good layouts, densely populated. These make ideal maps that you want to run in Greater Rifts. They've removed some of the spaghetti maps, some of the maps that are the opposite. Bad layouts, bad monster density. So the sewers of Chaldeum and the hidden aqueducts are being removed. They've tooled with the probability of Greater Rift maps, of monster groups, and they've retooled how much progression and XP a number of monsters give to further incentivize you to actually go through the rift, to actually kill the monsters rather than skip them. And then lastly, players can speak to Orek to close an active Greater Rift. This option is only available when in a single player game. So all of these changes make pushing Greater Rifts significantly better. Dev comments, we wanted to improve the Greater Rift experience through quality of life updates, balance changes, and addressing community feedback. We reviewed all the maps and monsters that appear in Greater Rifts and reworked the probabilities overall to make sure players spend more time with the content they enjoy. Less spaghetti, more chickens. So again, this, yes, this change right here, excellent quality of life. The ability to close an active Greater Rift Right now, the only way to do that is to leave the game. So, small change might not seem like a big deal, but this all ties into Greater Rift Fishing. What is Greater Rift Fishing? Every Greater Rift has a cornucopia of RNG elements, a, a whole smorgasbord of different things that are randomized. Random map, random monster types, random uh, pylons that spawn. There are so many random factors. And some maps are good maps and some maps are bad maps. Some monsters are good monsters, some are bad, some pylons are ideal, some are not. And so when all of these RNG factors line up in a way that benefits you, well, you get a really good and easy Greater Rift to clear. Whereas when all of those RNG factors work against you, you get a very challenging Greater Rift. You can have two Greater Rifts of the exact same level. Two GR120s, two GR130s, two GR100s, it doesn't matter. And the experience within them is vastly different, where one is much easier than the other, based simply on these RNG factors and how they line up. You can do a GR100 and find it really challenging, and then do a GR102 and find it really easy because of these RNG factors. So, all the top clears that you see on the leaderboards, rank 1, rank 2, rank 3, all these guys... They're not opening a greater rift of 150 and just doing it. They're not going to bother trying to go through the entire greater rift when they know, well, I know what I'm looking for. I know what makes an ideal greater rift. I know that I'm looking for this map or these maps, these monsters, these pylons. And if I'm not seeing them, why should I waste my time trying a suboptimal rift when all it's costing me is a minute of my time or 30 seconds of my time and a greater rift key. Both of which I can recover relatively quickly. So I'm going to back out, give up on this greater rift, and open another. And let's see, is this a good layout? Is this my dream rift? Nope. Okay, try again. And these top players go through 50 to 100 
greater rifts before they find one that meets enough of their criteria that it is worth their time to try to push. Why? Because if you are pushing your limits, whatever that limit is, whether it's a 140, whether it's a 150, whether it's a 100, whatever your upper limit is, if you are struggling to complete, if you're just barely completing a 99 and you're going, you're gunning for a 100, then you know you're going to fail that 100 on, ba on a bad RNG rift. So why bother wasting 14, 15 minutes of your time struggling when you know, well, if I just keep trying and get my RNG lined up, then I have a much better chance of successfully completing on time that greater rift. This is not the way the devs intended the game to be played. Fishing has been a thing pretty much since the start of Greater Rifts, but this is not dev intent, and this is not something the players desire to do, but it is the most effective way to place and rank on the leaderboard, so this is what happens. So now that Greater Rifts have a chance to spawn as an Oryx Dream, right, you'll know right away It'll save these players maybe 30 seconds to a minute knowing instantly, ah, oh, well, it's an Oryx dream that automatically means it is worth pursuing. Because all of these changes here, these are all changes that turn a greater rift into something that is meeting the criteria of these players. Now, for the average player who is not greater rift fishing, for the average player or for I mean, most of what people do is not push, but is just run and farm Greater Rifts. An Oryx Dream will occasionally be a, oh, well, that was a really nice Rift. Now, that said, I have an idea on how to improve upon this system even more, but we'll get to that later on. So, let's move on here. This is a positive change, and we move on to the balance changes, of which there aren't a whole lot, but... The Barbarian's Raycor set is being changed in a significant way. So two-piece bonus stays the same, but the four-piece bonus. Furious Charge gains the effect of every rune and deals 1000% increased damage. Previously, full stop there. That's where it ended. Now, for every 1% life you are missing, the damage of your Ancient Spear is increased by 2%. But we're seeing the inclusion of Ancient Spear here, and uh, potentially a desire to remain low on life, so maybe a tie-in with the Shimizu Haori, which is an item that when you are below a, a certain amount of life, I think it's roughly 33 or 35% life, your all your hits are guaranteed crits. This item has found very niche usage, maybe this will be a usage case for it, but it's definitely turning into a throw barb build. Which is interesting because even in Diablo 2 Resurrected, we're seeing love thrown to the throw thrown <laughs> to the throw barbs. I wonder if there was some collaboration here between the two teams, but we'll keep going because we lean in even further to this throw barb fantasy. So hitting enemies with furious charge increases the damage of your next ancient spear by 5,500%. Now, typically, this was your next fury spending attack. So this is a change. It used to apply to any number of skills. So we would have Hoda Raycor, we had Seismic Slam Raycor. These builds are dying. Raycor will now purely be Ancient Spear and Charge. Not only does it deal more damage, but it causes it to release multiple spears from its target. It's unclear exactly what that means right now, but I imagine it just means you throw a spear, it collides with an enemy, and then, you know, let's say eight spears shoot out all in different directions. This effect stacks and is consumed from each released spear. This can only consume a maximum of five stacks at a time. So the rest of these mechanics are the same as the current six-piece bonus, it appears. The main change here, again, is that now it is just Ancient Spear, and it's making Ancient Spear into an area attack, effectively. Now, of course, that's not enough to make it viable. We need supplementary items that further buff Ancient Spear, so we got a couple here in the form of Ariot's Law. Ariot's Law used to be just for Weapon Throw. Now, Weapon Throw and Ancient Spear deal increased damage. Weapon Throw generates up to 25 additional Fury based on the distance of the enemy hit. It used to be 20. And now they're adding Ancient Spear refunds up to 25 Fury based on the distance of the enemy hit. Now, it's not specified here, but previously, the maximum benefit will be received when the enemy is 20 or more yards away, which is actually quite a short distance. Half of a screen is 50 yards, so a full screen is 100 yards, but an enemy will never be 100 yards away. An enemy cannot be more than 50 yards away because then you wouldn't be seeing him. So 20 yards is a little bit less than 
a quarter of a screen. I mean, my box here is just about 20 yards. So I'm not sure if they removed that just because they didn't want to clutter up the verbiage here or if they are actually doing away with that limit or altering it otherwise. Then the second supporting item, and you're going to basically, you're going to have one of these in your cube and you're going to be equipping the other. The 300th spear increases the damage of weapon throw and ancient spear by 200%. So same effect, but they're dialing up the number from 60% up to 200%. And then the Scholar Salvation Bracers. These formerly just buffed Ancient Spear Boulder Toss Rune. Now increases the damage of Ancient Spear, period, by 200. So it's also a buff to the numbers. It used to be 100, now it's 200. And then if your Ancient Spear Boulder Toss hits five or fewer enemies, the damage is increased. So that part is the same and is actually a nerf. The damage increase used to be up to 150, now it's just 100. But overall, this still is a buff because of the 200 that they added over there. Dev notes, we reworked Raycor's legacy to give the set its own identity. It felt natural to the team to infuse the charging fantasy of Raycor's legacy with the Barbarian's ranged skills. Imagine a javelin thrower who gets a running start before throwing his javelin. That's how it was made sense to me that, oh, okay, charging and throwing. Yeah, all right, that, that works together. So Raycor previously, its fantasy was really just charging, but while that was the original idea behind it, and way back in the day, the charge barb, there was a time when the charge barb was a top barb build, where you would literally just charge, 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 smashing your head against enemies repeatedly. What has become of Raycor is that it's kind of the Swiss army knife, or it's one of the multiple Swiss army knives of the Barbarian, where through Raycor, charge is a vehicle by which you're going to deliver damage, and you're going to do that via any number of spenders. So we have Hammer of the Ancients, again, we have Seismic Slam. It would be no real strong identity. So this gives it a very strong identity of a throw barb. The one concern here is that Raycor's four piece does not give any amount of damage reduction. Typically what you see in a six piece set, the six piece is where all the big damage buff lies. The two piece does Kind of whatever. It obviously benefits the build in some way, but you can't put too much on the two piece because then you got to be worried about them combining it, players combining the two piece bonus of multiple sets and making something completely broken. So it's really the four piece and the six piece that tend to be the most significant. And on the four piece is where you tend to see some kind of massive damage reduction, something where you get circa 50% damage reduction. If Raycord does not receive something like that or some vehicle through which it can receive consistently and with almost 100% uptime, about 50% damage reduction or more, it's going to be very squishy and thus suffer tremendously when trying to push it in the higher GRs. That said, that's a pretty simple fix. What's important, I guess, to begin with is to get some throw barb game on. We'll revisit this again when we do our final analysis, but we'll keep going for now. Crusader, Thorns of the Invoker. We're seeing some nerfs to Crusader. And they are warranted. So Thorns of the Invoker, this is a change to the six piece. And the change here is that previously, this damage buff was only applying to the first enemy hit. Now, it applies, well, I guess to anyone, because there's just no specification anymore. So this was intended as a buff to Invoker. What scale of buff will this be? It's difficult to determine that without testing. It's difficult to theorycraft exactly the ramifications of this buff, but they are buffing it because they are nerfing Norvald's Fervor. Norvald's used to give you a 400% increase damage. Now that is getting cut in half, down to 200%. So this is a nerf of roughly four Greater Rift levels. This is justified. As the dev notes say, Norvald's is overperforming across multiple sets. We want to bring its power down, but we are increasing the utility of Thorns of the Invoker to compensate. And that's because Invoker was not an OP set, so it's getting caught in the crossfire of nerfing Norvalds. So that's why they're trying to buff Invoker to compensate. However, a Khan Bombardment, super powerful S-tier build, uses Norvalds. Heaven's Fury Crusader, still S-tier, still super powerful, uses Norvalds. The devs have tried nerfing Heaven's Fury over and over again. It still remained S-tier for over a year. So by nerfing Norvalds, they're able to knock four Greater Rifts off both these builds. 
and they're gonna compensate Invoker. Hopefully maybe bring Invoker up into S tier, who knows, we'll see. This is not going to kill Norvald's builds. This is not going to kill a Kanban Barman. It's not gonna kill Heaven's Fury Seder. Onto the Monk. Bindings of the Lesser Gods, enemies hit by your Cyclone Strike. So what they're changing here basically, they're removing the addendum that said Fire Allies benefit by this by a factor of five. They're removing that in a Monk. Fire specifically for pushing. Incredibly powerful. I'm honestly surprised it was not nerfed last season. We Monk players, or you know, I've been running Monk as long as Inna's been a, a crazy powerful thing. We got to enjoy the super overpoweredness. Now it's time <laughs> to simmer down. This is not affecting the cold version of this build in any way. It's just a nerf to the fire version and it is absolutely warranted because this build was out of control. So that covers the changes here. Let's give a little bit more analysis and maybe feedback on what we're seeing. So again, the season theme, Echoing Nightmare. I believe it's great that we're given a new activity to do. There are, you know, concern is a strong word, but questions around how exactly this is going to work. And we'll have those questions answered in a couple days when PTR starts. But one question is, is this going to be one to one? Do I do one greater rift and get one petrified scream or what's the drop rate otherwise? And the next question is, are petrified screams going to be something that we will want to do a significant amount of the time or basically is it just going to be for getting our augments? Because if it's just for the augments, then at a certain point you're done and then you're going back to just doing greater rifts every day forever. So I think the balance point you want to reach with Echoing Nightmares is that you want to make them scarce enough and rewarding enough that you will always want to run them when you get them. Because what you don't want is to arrive at a situation where, well, there's no point in doing these anymore because by speedrunning GRs, I'm going to get more XP, legendaries, blood shards, etc. You also don't want to be in a position where this is the only thing that we do. I suppose... Even if it were the case, even if somehow you were in a position where all you're doing are Echoing Nightmares, getting a break from just always doing Greater Rifts wouldn't be so bad, but let's imagine this is a system you want to add to the game forever, then getting a nice balance, I think, is ideal. But by the same token, you don't want to arrive at a point where Echoing Nightmares become to Greater Rifts what Greater Rifts are to Rifts. That is to say, People almost begrudgingly farm rifts just to get the keys for greater rifts. But overall, again, I do believe the right tipping point of balance can be achieved here where players will still desire to do greater rifts and not feel like they're a waste of time and that they're not just doing them to get Echoing Nightmare. But then when they do get an Echoing Nightmare, they absolutely do want to run it. As for the greater rift updates, this is absolutely a positive thing. However, I believe with more work and effort, and maybe this could not possibly make it into uh, the development cycle for this content update, but I think this idea can be improved upon by turning Oryx Dream into something that drops as a key. So let's say right now, one percent of greater rifts have it will, will spawn as or extreme so one percent of the time that you open a greater rift it is an or extreme change that to one percent of gr keys drop as or extreme keys this way you have a deterministic way to open an or extreme you can save those keys and specifically when you want to push you can push because this improves fishing, but I believe if you get Oryx Dream keys, you solve fishing completely. Because now, what are you going to do? You're just going to farm Greater Rifts like you're already doing. And when you get that Oryx Dream key, you know, and you're going to save that key for when you want to push. This way you don't have to farm when you want to push. The thing is, this requires building up new UI elements. You need to adjust the Greater Rift opening thing to add now a new option. You have you have Rifts, you have Greater Rifts, now you have Oryx Dream as another option to open. You need to have in your little inventory screen Greater Rift keys and now Oryx Dream keys. So I know modifying the user interface is something that is very challenging to do within Diablo 3 based on how 
the user interface was first coded in. So that's why I feel it's not likely for them to do this in time for the season. But hopefully in the future, because I'm trying to think of any potential downsides to making it this drop like this, and I don't see in what way this is anything but an improvement over the system. The top leaderboard pushers now are no longer going to spend an hour, two hours, an afternoon fishing for the perfect GR. And the people that can't be bothered to fish, they also now will be able to experience trying to actually push. Myself, personally, I hate fishing. I don't do it. I refuse. It makes me miserable. I hate it. Massive props to the people that can tolerate it, that, that go through it, that have that competitive drive to suffer through it. Because I do believe it is suffering. It is not fun. It is not how the game should be played. But I would push more if I had a deterministic way to open up an ideal Greater Rift to attempt. Okay, then going back to the balance change of the Barbarian. Again, Raycor getting completely changed into a throw barb. Cool. We need to give him some toughness somewhere. So maybe we do something like for every 1% life you are missing, the damage of Ancient Spear is increased by 2%, and you gain 2% damage reduction up to a maximum of 80%. Right? Real simple. This kind of keeps the flavor of what you're trying to do here. Uh, it's not just you always have 80% damage reduction, which is kind of the most boring way to do it. But it adds that much needed toughness. Crusader nerf is good. Monk nerf is good. If it turns out that these nerfs are too severe, that they dump these builds down into like B tier, which I cannot imagine. The, the monk nerf is something like 10 greater rifts, but... Again, the build was absolutely bonkers out of control. Tuning can always be done. That's what PTR is for. So whenever you see changes at the start of a PTR, hold on to your hats. Wait for testing. They always make or are open to making further balance changes. And they will often over-tune or under-tune to start with um, in order to get reactions and see what people are saying. Uh, because if you don't make a significant enough balance change on PTR, not enough people are going to test it out. So they tend to overdo things at the start. But overall, this seems very reasonable. And that's going to basically wrap things up. So again, we'll have testing going on for two weeks starting Thursday. We'll be reporting back with more findings. I think this is a very promising looking season. It's a little light on the balance changes. We're just getting basically... Uh, a barbarian season that one barbarian build is getting that buff but as always they rotate through the different classes over the seasons that go by significant new content thing that's being added we're looking forward to see how that's going to work and i turn the question to you folks sound off in the comments with your thoughts on this update are you looking forward to season 26 Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my Twitch, Patreon, and YouTube supporters for making these videos possible. If you like what you see on this channel and want to support the creation of more content, you can consider pledging on YouTube or Patreon and unlocking behind-the-scenes content, monthly virtual hangouts, and more. If you enjoyed this video, please share it. Check out these other videos and subscribe to join Rikers Raiders for more Diablo content.